everybody. This is our 36th video, lecture video, and we ended last time um, just starting a uh, proof of the boundedness theorem. And so what I want to do is rewrite that theorem on the board and then go ahead and finish the proof of it. So we just want to cover it there to start off with. So here's the statement of the theorem. It says, let I be defined to be the integral from A to B, including A to B. And we're saying, hey, don't forget, this is a, a closed. Are you happy with it here? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. It's better that the audio is not being recorded. Yes, it lies. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Be a closed, um, bounded interval. And let F go from I to R be continuous on I. Then F is bounded on I. If I remember last time, we barely got started on that. But I kind of went over what the proof was going to be like. Well, let's take our time here. Okay, so we're going to start off by um, let, I'm going to write it this way, let F be defined from A to B into R. And let f, or such that, or with, I'll say with, f being continuous. <clears throat> On a to b. Okay, we want to show I didn't write this, but if you remember, the proof's going to be by contradiction. So this is by contradiction. So what we want to show is that F is bounded on A B. A contradiction type situation, let's suppose not. Suppose F is not on A. <coughs> okay, well, what does that mean? That means that no matter what number you look at, it's not a bound for the absolute value. In A to B. Okay, it's not a bound. So that, is, that means the following. So for each natural number, so for each n element of the natural numbers, that n is not an upper bound. So what that means is there exists an x of n, it's not an upper bound for the output value. That's the thing. That means there's an input value, x of n, such that that x of n. N, A to B, such that um, the absolute value of F of X of N will be bigger than or equal to, will be bigger than this little N. Hey, you think that N's a upper bound? No, it's not. I can find some input value such that the absolute value uh, of that input value of F of that input value is bigger than the number you gave. You gave you Thus, what we're looking at when I look at for each n, I get an x of n. That means that I'm creating a subsequence. 
uh, not a subsequence, but a sequence. We have created a sequence. Xn. <coughs> okay. From A to B. So every term in the sequence is in here. <coughs> now, what I notice is that if x sub n is in here, between A to B, all the values for each n, that is each x of n, is in between A to B. So that means the sequence is a bounded sequence. It's bounded between these two numbers. Okay? So if you give me a bounded sequence by the, uh, uh, well, so first of all, so x sub n is therefore a bounded sequence. And what do we know about every bounded sequence? It has a convergent subsequence. So that's by the Bolzano virus, trust me. So by the Bolzano virus trials, good old virus trials theorem. There exists uh, x sub n sub r, let's say. I have to k, that's what we always call it. k minus 1, 2, 3, 3, 3. That, that is a subsequence, <coughs> a conversion subsequence of x sub n. x sub n was totally contained in A to B, so x sub n sub k is totally contained in A to B. Note, um, for every k element in n, we have A is less than or equal to x sub n sub k, which is less than or equal to B. Now, I know the limit is k goes to infinity. Uh, exists. Now, uh, uh, let the limit as k goes to infinity of x of n sub k be represented by something, x. How come I can say that? Because we know that x of n sub k is converged. So they converge to something, let's just give it a name. Call it x. <coughs> <coughs> then, by a previous fact about sequence, if you've got a sequence that converges, and each term of the sequence is sandwiched in between the two numbers. What it converges to has to be sandwiched in between these two numbers. So that means that A has to be less than or equal to X, which has to be less than B. So what I just found is, is that the thing, the <laughs> limit, the, the number that the X of N sub K is converged to, it's also in the interval A to B. Okay? And what do I know about the function over that interval? Well, the function is, by hypothesis, it was continuous. Okay? Since <coughs> f is continuous at, uh, or on a to b, then f is continuous at a. Sequential criterion for continuity. What was 
that. That said, hey, look, if you're continuing to see any sequence in the domain of the function that converges to C, we have that that f of that sequence will converge to f of C. <laughs> <laughs> so here, what that's going to say is that f of x sub n sub k as a sequence converges <laughs> to f of x. But that's going to be our contradiction. And the reason it is, however, what do I know about f of x sub n sub k? Well, inside absolute values. The x sub n sub k were part of the x sub n's. And we knew that the f of x sub n's, they were always greater than the, the index of the x. So this has got to be greater than or equal to, or greater than, n sub k, which is greater than k. So what does that tell me? That tells me, thus, that x of n, the f of x of n k's, <coughs> this k runs from 1 to infinity, look, is unbounded. It's bigger than, and there's a term out there, it's bigger than any, uh, than each of the natural numbers. No matter what you give me, I get an natural number bigger than that, I'll have f of x of uh, n sub k that's bigger than that. It's that absolute values. <coughs> so it's unbounded. And what we know about every convergent sequence, you give me a convergent sequence, I'll tell you one thing about it, it is bounded. Look, this guy is supposed to converge. Then it is bounded. It says it converges. F of x of n sub k is bounded. That's the contradiction. So one side we think of it as unbounded. <coughs> on the other hand, it's got to be bound. That's a contradiction. So we didn't make a mistake in our logic. There must have been something in our assumption that's wrong. And so what did we assume that we didn't have to assume? We assumed that um, that f wasn't bounded. So that means so f must be bounded. On a bit. So if f was continuous on so closed bound interval, well, it had to be bound in that closed bound interval. <coughs> that is that proof. If someone told me, it's so nice to make these boxes. We're done. I've just got one more topic. I mean, I probably will get through all the course materials today. So we'll be done. And then on Monday, we'll prepare for the test. It's on Wednesday. Wednesday, we'll take the test. And on Friday, we'll do a little preparation for the final. Okay. So that's what I got in mind. And your final is on Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. Wednesday. We okay, Audra? Um, I actually have a question. I'm ready. So, um, on the 20th, I don't know what lecture we have, we um, did a proof for um, the square root of, uh, proving that f square root of f is continuous. Is if f, continuous if, at c? If f is continuous at c, that's right. But we didn't do the part where it's continuous on a. Or um, I missed it, or it doesn't need to be done. Well, okay, so there's something out there that I, I, I think I'll left off. So, Aldra was kind of saying, uh, so, uh, Aldra, if you don't mind, I'll uh, address I didn't know that. if I missed it or if I missed it. No, if you didn't miss it, I missed it. 
Okay. So I'm going to go ahead with this train of thought, and then uh, if you don't mind, uh, either uh, we try to remember next time or at the end of this time to write that part out. So okay. I wouldn't approve it, but I just wanted to stay. Okay. <clears throat> well, wait just a second. Did I say that in the problem? I'll draw next to you. I want to see exactly what that looks like. All right. So we have a fact and a question. Okay. Yeah. Right. And then we did the proof for at continuous at C, but I didn't know if we were supposed to do part two. No, I wasn't interested in doing part two except to say this. How do you do part B? So here's what Audra's asking right now. Audra, you did great. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, Audra's recollecting back, might as well listen now. Uh, Audra's recollecting back that if we have. Um, F defined from A to R, and uh, with F of X being greater than or equal to zero for all X in A, and <coughs> F of X is, uh, and F is continuous. on A, then the square root of F acting on X is continuous on A. So this was part B. Did I write it down? Was that correct? Yes, I think I see how you would do it. Okay. Because we did a proof earlier that incorporated if C belongs to B, and so, we proved, proved right. continuous at C, Right. And it would be continuous on B. For each C that's in B. That's right. Right, and so it would be the same. Exactly. Okay. Okay. All right. And I so I'm going to say this for everybody else. Okay. So here's the proof. I'm going to write it down to here. So <clears throat> I, I didn't write this down, and I should. I'm sorry. So here we're going to let F go from A to R with... F of X to be greater than zero for all X elements A. And F uh, is continuous on A. Okay. <clears throat> uh, we want to show the square root of F is continuous on A. So how do I show that a function, here's the square root of f, how do I show any function is continuous on a set? The way we do it is we say, well, it's got to be, the function we're trying to show is continuous on a set, has to be continuous for every c in the set. So how do I show that square root of f is continuous for every point in a? Well, I don't know what the points are in a, so the way we do it is, in a general fashion, we just let c be an element of a. And what we want to do is show that f, the square root of f is continuous at c. Okay. That's what we want to do. <clears throat> um. Well, uh, since F is continuous on A, and C is an element of A, then F is continuous at at C. And by the previous part of this theorem, if F is continuous at C, then the there is that. All right. Is continuous at C. But C is an arbitrary point of A. And so if the square root of F is continuous for every point in C, or any point in C, C 
C element of A was arbitrary. That's telling us that the square root of F is continuous for all C element of A. Thus, we would say the square root of F is continuous on A. Audra, thank you very much. I didn't want to leave something out there. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry about that. Um, the next thing we'll do is do some definitions. Okay. This last kind of topic. So, um, the first definition, well, we'll do two at the same time. There's really two definitions. Here's the setup. We let A go from R, I'm sorry, let A be a subset of R, and F go from A to R. <clears throat> we set so this is kind of definition. We say, um, a, uh, say F has an absolute maximum on A if there is some point X, let's say superscript star in A such that F of X superscript star is bigger than or equal to F of X for all X element of A. So that's what an absolute maximum. And what we say, I'll say this. In this case, F of X star is the absolute maximum. Of F on A. So the Y value is the absolute maximum. We say that it has an absolute maximum if there exists this input value, X superscript star. This says that F evaluated that X superscript star is the biggest output value. <clears throat> well, if I can define the absolute maximum, I ought to be able to define the, the minimum. And that's what I'm going to do. Uh, so here we've already, this is, I'm sorry, I shouldn't even call it the main definition. Sorry, it shouldn't be clear. We say F has an absolute minimum. star such that f of x subscript star is less than or equal to f of x for all x element of a. In this case, uh, f of x 
subscript star is called the absolute minimum. on absolute minimum of F on A. I like to look at some examples. <clears throat> Let's examine f of x equaling uh, x on, just on this part, minus 1 to 2. Let's make it 2. So this is uh, this is uh, example. Then uh, graphically, here's what it looks like. So two x. If I stick in minus one, I get out minus two. If I stick out in two, I get out positive four. Okay. So, um, here's what I notice. Note the absolute max. Yes, this is what I like. So that's the max for this function, just over this, this interval. That's the only place we're looking. That's where we only define. I'll say it this way. On minus 1 to 2 is. So I'm looking for the biggest output value. What would you say it is? What's the biggest output value? 4. 4. But here's what we say. Is f of, uh, it would be 2, which equals to 4. It happens when x is 2. What about the absolute min? So I should say this one. Of f on minus 1 to 2 is, what's the answer? It's f of minus 1, which equals 2, 2. Minus 2, I said the wrong thing. Um, if it's bounded, then it has absolute max and absolute min. Yeah, that, that, if that, yeah, that's right, it does. And that's really by uh, the completeness property on R in this uh, analogous statement. That's true. If it's not bounded, um, <clears throat> that, that's right. If, if it's not bounded, then it's probably, then it's missing an absolute max. Well, um, if it is bounded, it still might be missing. I'll show you an example of that. If you will uh, allow me. Um, so I should say, if, if, it's, if it has absolute max and absolute min, it was bounded. That's what you can say. Uh, but just because it's bounded doesn't mean it has absolute max and absolute min. Okay? 
So let, let's look at this. <clears throat> As an example, I do it now. I look at f of x, this is my example too. f of x is equal to 2x on minus 1 to 2. And so when I draw that, here's what it looks like. I say, what's the absolute max? Okay, wait just a second. What is it? Absolute max is supposed to be the largest output value. And you've got to have an input value that generates that largest output value. Here, the answer is it does not exist. Exist. What do you mean? Isn't the answer four? No. The answer isn't four. Because there's no x value from minus one to two open interval that says the f of that output value equals to four. Is that okay? There isn't one. So you can't say four is the absolute, uh, you can't say uh, four is the absolute max because you never get to there. Is that okay with everybody? And what else could I say here about the absolute min? It doesn't exist. Could one exist and another one not exist? Yes, ma'am. Let's do another example. So, if you have absolute max, absolute min, you're bounded. Just because you're bounded, because this guy was bounded, doesn't mean that you have absolute max and absolute min. Can one of them exist and one and one not? Sure. Consider f of x equaling uh, e to the minus x over two. My e to the minus, let's say, x squared. All right, so what does that look like? Believe that graph looks like this. <clears throat> and this is on off. And to the far left, it's getting closer and closer to what y value? You're looking at the graph. What's it getting closer and closer to? Zero. Yeah. Zero. To the far right, it's getting closer and closer to? Zero. Is that okay? So here's what I want. What about the absolute max? I've drawn the graph, I think, fairly accurately. What about the absolute max? What would you say? What, 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 are you kidding? Yeah. What is it? Absolute max is f of zero. If you let x be zero, we get out of here. One. Okay. That's what you get. What about the absolute min? Yeah, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Is that okay? Okay, let's look at another example. Consider f of x equal to x squared on r. Well, I think we know what that graph looks like. It looks like it looks like the referee's arms when the Alabama running back gets the ball. <laughs> Uh -huh. 
Okay, absolute max. What's our answer? Good answer. Absolute min. What's our answer? Zero. Yeah, so I say it's f of zero, which equals to zero. That's right, it is zero. Is that okay with everybody? So we. Could you go over that one more time? Sure. So look, there is no highest y value of that because the graph goes up. Yeah, to infinity in both directions. Okay. The far right's going out and up forever. The far left is going out and up forever. Okay. So there is no absolute mass. Why is this? This is a dot here, okay? It's closed in. Why is there an absolute min? Because there is a smallest y value of tan. It is zero. It gets to zero. They get below zero, zero is the smallest thing it attains. And it attains the function of tan zero when you're looking at f of zero. So just to be a minimum, you have to be. An absolute minimum. Zero, an absolute minimum, you have to be zero. You have to be the smallest. Less than zero? No. no. You have to be the smallest y value of tan. So look at the y values. Is one of tan? Sure, it's a thing when you have x equal to 1 or x equal to minus 1. Is that okay? Look at all the things that are the output values, the y values. If I were to squish this graph to the words of the y-axis, I would get from 0 to infinity. Did we reach 0? Yes, when x was 0. That's why. Okay. Good. So as opposed to this guy, <clears throat> so the one still on the board here. You know what? Let's stay back over here for a second. So when I look at this guy right here and I squish towards the y-axis to look at the uh, output values, uh, the, the range. The range here is from 0 to 1. Is that okay? 0 to 1. That's what this is, squish it to. I don't get to 0. I never hit the x-axis with this graph. The graph never hits right. I'm not the graph. So there is no absolute minimum, but there is an absolute max because we get to, the graph hits 1. That's okay. Okay. Well, there are examples out there that. <clears throat> you have both absolute max and min. There are examples out there you have neither. And there are examples out there you have absolute max. And an example out there where you just have absolute min. A question. Yes, sir. A constant function, is that going to. Are, are uh, with absolute min and max be the same? Yep. Okay. So which has absolute max, absolute min? They're the same. That's right. Okay. Here's a big fact. This last thing in terms of the coverage. This is it. Woo -hoo. <laughs> it's called the max min theorem. <clears throat> Here's what it says. This left I be defined to be A to B. A closed bounded minimum. Okay. And let F go from I into R um, be continuous. on I, then F has an absolute max and an absolute min. So this theorem, before I turn, says the following. Look, you want to guarantee that you got an absolute max and absolute min for a function? 
First of all, you'd find it on the closed balance envelope. That's one way to guarantee it. The theorem says, look, if you're looking at the closed balance envelopes, there's the domain. And not only that, but if the function is continuous, okay, this isn't the only way to get an absolute maximum. But if you get this way, if you give me a function that's defined on a closed balance interval that's continuous on that interval, then it's going to have absolute max and absolute min on that interval. Boundness is going to come into play. So let's see how much of proof we can get done. And this is the last thing. Um, proof. Dr. Whitaker, uh -huh. why does it have to be continuous? Okay. I've shown an example where uh, if, if it's not continuous. So, uh, no, maybe I have. I'm sorry. No, maybe I have. So let's look for one. I thought I'd shown an example. Maybe I have. X over so, N, right? Say that again? X over N. Um, would that work? So here, you can look at this, this uh, function. Uh, maybe I didn't show it. So uh, here, let's let um, uh, f of x be equal to 2. You didn't ask anything bad of it. Thank you. I, my answer wasn't supposed to be bad either. On uh, f of x can be defined to be 2 over x if uh, 0 is less than or equal to x is less than, let's say, 2. Okay? And uh, let's say it's equal to 1 if uh, x equals to 2. Let's look at this picture. <clears throat> what does this picture look like? So here it starts at 0, 1, 2. It goes almost up to 4. But right at 2, it's divided by 2. That's what I'm looking at. Okay. It's not continuous at 2. Here, what I want to tell you, this, this does not have, what am I going to say? Does not have an, doesn't have an absolute max. It's got an absolute min, but doesn't have an absolute max. <coughs> no, thank you. That's a good question to ask about. So I'm sorry. I thought maybe I had done it, but this is good. Let's do more to make sure. So the continuity is important. That's a good thing. Thank you very much for getting me. Show me. So first. So we let F be defined from some closed bound interval, A B into R. B continues. <coughs> On A B. You know, before I go through this proof, I'm so glad, Audrey, you asked this question, because it's important for us. Okay? It's not only important for us just to show the continuity, but um, it's also going to be something important for the proof, this example to illustrate some of this. So I'm very glad you asked this question. So, um, here's what I'm thinking. What do we want to show? We want to show that it has absolute maximum. That's what we want to show. Well, I'm not going to write that down. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the set um, of f of x. So these are real numbers, such that x is an element of a. Well, if we consider these, the output values. Okay, consider this collection of output values. In terms of, I want to name this guy. Let's name this guy right here, this set. Let's call it, uh, let's call it the set little r, not script r. I mean, um, uh, r, big r, but not script r. It's not the real one. Just call it r. Kind of like the range. That's the range of numbers. Okay. Okay. Well, since f is continuous, on <coughs> A to B, then what do we know? We know that
that the absolute value of f of x, we know that f of x is bounded on a b. That was by the boundedness theorem. Okay? All right. Um, so if you, so R, what we're saying, is bound. So R is a set of, of non-empty real numbers. It's a non-empty set of real numbers. That's what R is. It's not all of the real numbers, necessarily, but it's a non-empty set of real numbers. What do you know about every bounded non-empty subset of R? Well, it has a and supreme. So by the completeness property. on the real numbers, not this R, but on the real numbers. The nth of R, let's say that's equal to S subscript, and the soup of R, let's say that's equal to S superscript, exists. Well, I mean, that means the function's got a max and a min, right? No, it doesn't. We're just saying the output values are, have a max in, or have a, an infimum and supreme. So I'm going to just very cl clearly say, when we look back at this example, that's why I'm glad Aldra got us right. Look, this output, the output values, uh, is from 0 to 4. Okay? It's a bounded set. But... It doesn't have an absolute max because you don't reach four. Even though it's bounded above by four, you didn't reach it. So what we're saying over here is that, hey, the output values, they have a supreme one, like four was for here. Okay? Okay? So <clears throat> this is like four in the example. But we can't say that we have an absolute maximum because we don't know that we reach it. We don't know that there's an x in the domain of the function, it says that f of that x equals to s subscript star. And we don't have, we don't know we have a minimum. There's a, uh, an absolute minimum because we don't know there's an x in a to b such that f of x equals to s subscript star. Does that make sense? Okay. So we will show, I'll only do one part because they're very similar and we'll run out of time. We will show, um, there, uh, Absolute max exists by showing <coughs> there exists an X, I'm going to call it superscript star in A to B with, with what? With F of X superscript star equaling the S star. I need a few more minutes, but our time is up. So I'm going to spend six, seven minutes, ten minutes next class period, anyway, and then we'll have the uh, rest of the time to review for our test. Okay, so I'm going to stop. All right. Thank you very much for your time and patience. We'll finish this up next time, and that'll be our time.